All right, welcome everyone to our Nova Scotia Ed Talk webinar series for Nova Scotia educators. Today's session is on EBSCO, a tutorial of the online resources and research tools using EBSCO databases effectively with your students. And it's my honor to welcome and thank Joe Sturski for joining us here this afternoon. Um, uh, uh, as a representative from EBSCO to give us a tutorial on um, on EBSCO and, and how you can best use it into your classrooms. So without further ado, I'm going to hand the mic over to Joe and relinquish my hosting duties to him for now. Joe? All right, thank you, Chris. And uh, hopefully my audio is a little bit better now than it was earlier. I just realized it wasn't coming through my headset. It was coming through my computer. But anyway, welcome, everyone. Um, as Chris said, my name is Joe Satursky. I work for EBSCO. I am the EBSCO Northeast Regional Trainer. And uh, by Northeast, we mean the Northeast Quadrant of North America. So I cover the, the Northeastern United States and Eastern Canada. And that's what I'm doing here today. And I'm here to talk to you about uh, some of the uh, the marvelous resources, actually, that you have available from EBSCO. And I have a few PowerPoint slides to share with you. I'm going to try not to spend too much time on PowerPoint. It's more fun to watch things moving. But um, if I can make this work properly, if everyone keep your fingers crossed. This is my first time using this particular um, web webinar service. I'm already messing up. What did I do wrong? There we go. Okay, so our agenda for today, I'm going to talk a little bit about content. Actually, that's uh, the, the most of my slides are about content because a lot of times people don't realize you know, all of the, the various uh, full text resources you have access to um, through the various uh, EBSCO interfaces and databases. So we'll talk a little bit about content. We'll talk about how to search in EBSCO and uh, give you some uh, tips for using EBSCO content in the classroom. I will take a look at the EBSCO support site too, where you can get a lot more information on how to use these resources. Now, I only have a few minutes today. I could spend an hour talking about each and every one of these five or six resources that we're going to talk about, but I'm not going to. We'll try to cover them all in about 45 minutes or so, uh, leaving time for questions. So now that I have just completely changed my screen, let's see if I can get back to... There we go. Um, as I said, I'm, I'm not uh, completely versed in this particular uh, webinar service. All right, so there's our agenda. I want to jump in and talk a little bit about databases and interfaces, first of all. And if everything's working properly, if it's not, let's share my screen. The, are you doing the oh, screen I, share, Joe? share my screen do I have to end the PowerPoint sharing first this works so well in rehearsal it does take a moment for the screen share uh, software to load up so once you click the button we will have to wait for a moment well I did load it earlier and it did work earlier didn't it it did yes well, let's try it again. Now, why did this work earlier but not work now? I'm just confused. I'm not sure, Joe. Maybe... I'll try to run the temporary screen sharing again. Maybe that's the issue. If that doesn't want to work, maybe I'll recommend that you just log out and log back in real quick and then uh, try one more time. Okay. Well, hopefully we won't have to do that. Oh, 
Okay, it says my screen is currently shared. Oh, it is. Okay. I don't know why. It, okay. Excellent. It's working. Um, just ignore the last well, few not, minutes there. No. Sorry, we're not actually seeing your screen share at this point. Really? It's telling me my screen is currently shared. Stop. Anyone else seeing it? Maybe it's just me. You know, technology is great. It works right up until it isn't. Let's try that again. Okay, so now it's telling me my screen. There we go, Joe. We can see you now. Okay, yeah. Yeah. okay good. Great. You can see me uh, yell if you can't. But, uh, so maybe we'll try not to bounce back and forth to PowerPoint so much since this is working. But uh, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about databases and interfaces. And, and maybe I'll save the PowerPoint for later, just in case I can't get back and forth. But you have access to several databases, several full text databases, and some A&I databases, or abstract and index databases from EBSCO. And uh, let me just try to talk through these a little bit without the PowerPoint. And I'm going to do it alphabetically here, because that's the way they're arranged. But you have Advanced Placement Source, which is a database um, designed for AP classes. It's a more academic database that has um, academic journals about a little over 5,000 full-text academic journals, um, a Canadian Reference Center, which has access to Canadian magazines, newspapers, and so forth, um, education research, we'll talk a little bit about that, and Eric, Middle Search Plus, which is a database uh, designed for, uh, for middle schools, for uh, grades it would be like, I'm not sure if it's the same in Canada, actually, but it would be about uh, grades 6 through 9 uh, here in the United States. Um, contains middle school magazines and primary search, which includes uh, full text magazines for uh, the younger students. Um, topic search we'll talk about. Um, Vente, uh, <laughs> boy, my French teacher would be so mad at me because I can't pronounce this, but uh, this database, which has uh, French language business journals, um, teacher Reference Center, History Reference Center, which has information related to history, um, Science Reference Center, as you could probably guess, has scientific information, Canadian Literary Re uh, Center, which has uh, information about uh, Canadian literature, the important Canadian literary magazines, and uh, all of those databases have content that's searchable through a variety of interfaces. So what's an interface? An interface is just a different way of searching a database. Um, we have the EBSCOhost web interface. That's where we're going to start out. That is the sort of the classic searching interface with a, a search box and a search button, advanced search, and so forth. Um, in some ways, it's the more, more sophisticated interface. All of this content can be searched via that interface. Um, we also have an interface which is simpler to use, and that's Explora. And Explora lets you search multiple databases from that list um, using a more uh, browsable, uh, user-friendly interface. Uh, the ones I want to talk about today are Explora Canada, Primary Schools, and the Educators Edition, which I think is important. I didn't want to go there yet. We also have interfaces which are designed for a particular type of content. So both EBSCOhost Web and Explora, they're multidisciplinary databases designed for a broad range of content. There's some interfaces which are designed specifically for certain uh, topic areas, um, Canadian Points of View, History Reference Center, Science Reference Center, and Literary Reference Center. And by their names, you can probably guess the sort of content that those are going to contain. So we're going to try to cover all of this in just a very short time. But one thing you'll find as I start going through this, uh, these interfaces and this content is that once you learn how to use one, you pretty much know how to use all the rest of them. Uh, the main differences are going to be differences in content, not so much in mechanics. But let's start out with the most, uh, I said the most sophisticated, which is true, but also in some ways the most basic interface, EBSCOhost Web. It's a classic searching interface that's uh, very similar. If you've never used EBSCO before, um, you can 
sit down and probably start using it. And I can really search any database here uh, using EBSCOhost Web, and, and they all act the same way. But let's just take a look at the Canadian Reference Center as our example. And when you enter into the EBSCOhost Web interface, you start here on the basic search. Uh, we have a search box and a search button. And at EBSCO, we've done a lot of end user research. And one thing we've discovered is that everyone in the world knows what to do with a search box and a search button. You don't need a lot of training. You know, everyone's used Google. This works in, in some ways, this works in the same way, at least with the initial search. Uh, down below, I do have some options for making my search more precise, but I don't need to use those. I'm just going to start out with something simple uh, and Canadian. Uh, I, earlier today, I was looking up uh, Justin Trudeau. And if I can't remember how to spell Justin Trudeau, you know, I, if you'll see down below as I start to type, I have suggestions for searches. Um, maybe I want to be more uh, specific and, and look at for information about his uh, recent India trip or women's rights or NAFTA or what have you. But let's just uh, start out simple. And when I do that search, it's a very simple search. Uh, but what's happening in the background is I'm anding those words together. In other words, I'm looking for any article that has the word Justin somewhere and the word Trudeau somewhere else within the uh, the detailed record, not the full text. I'm not searching full text here. I can. But um, where was I? I just noticed it was uh, it was misspelled, so it, it gave me the, the correct spelling. So there you go. But anyway, I'm just searching the information about the article, the detailed record. And this works the same way in any of these interfaces. The results are going to be ranked by relevance. So if my search terms appear in the subject headings, if they appear in the title, that article is going to be very near the top of my result set. If I want to see more information about the article, you know, all I have to do is click on the title. And that typically will show me an abstract, some subject headings, and so forth. Now the full text that you're going to find comes in one of two varieties. There's HTML full text and PDF full text. Not all articles have both. I like to pick one that does have both as an example, but I want to talk a little bit about how we can use this full text, and we have lots of options. But let's, uh, let's say we're interested in this article, maybe we want to use it in class. If I click on the HTML full text, now the HTML is typically just the words. You don't see any graphics here. Occasionally, you'll find a, an image or two. But it's typically just the words. But you can do a couple of things with HTML that you can't do with PDF. Now, HTML does have the translation option. This only works from English to other languages. It doesn't work the other way. But you know, if you wanted to translate this into French or whatever, Korean, um, you could do that using the translate function. Now, that is a computer doing the translating, so it's not going to be perfect, but it's usually good enough to get the gist of the article. The other thing that you can do with HTML is that you can have it read aloud to you, and you have your choice, choice of accents. Unfortunately, we don't have a Canadian accent available, but you can choose from American, Australian, and British. And uh, again, this is a computer doing the reading, so it's not going to be perfect. But, but I found that it's pretty good. It's pretty close. And this is great if you have low vision students, or uh, you can use that as a listening exercise. Um, I've also seen it used uh, if you have students who maybe have some struggles with reading. Um, you can find articles that might be just a little bit difficult for them to read and have them follow along uh, listening to the read aloud function. So there are a lot of uses with that for that. You can even download the audio file if you want to put it on your MP3 player and listen to it at the gym. But you can do that just with HTML. Now with either HTML or PDF, you can use this article in a number of ways. Um, one of them is Google Classroom. So if you're using Google Classroom to uh, manage your your classroom activities, your lesson planning, and so forth, it's very easy to add these articles to Google Classroom um, or to Google Drive. There's a link right there for either one. We can also, uh, excuse me, uh, print, email, save the information locally. If I want to cite this article, if I'm writing a report and I want to cite an article from EBSCO, you know, how do you cite 
an online full text article? Well, we'll tell you. Or we'll give you a suggestion. Um, we do have the proper citations in a number of popular citation formats. And those can be exported as well if you're using a, a citation management software. There's also a permalink to the article. So you know, say you're not using Google Classroom or Google Drive. If you have some other way of managing your, your classroom resources, a, a different classroom management service, or maybe just an online reading list, if I click on the hyperlink, or the, the permalink rather, I can copy and paste this link just about anywhere. And anyone can click that link and get to this article. Now, Anyone clicking the link, they would be authenticated. They would have to authenticate into EBSCOhost. Um, as long as they're inside the building, in the library or the school, um, they just click right through. If they're trying to access it from home, um, we'd have to look at ways that we can help them easily authenticate into EBSCO. That link will always work. If you want to uh, tweet about this article or share it with your Facebook friends or pin it or put it up on Tumblr, um, you can do that as well. So that's the HTML version of the article. Uh, the PDF, as you're probably aware, it's going to be the same article, but it's going to be a representation of that article as it appeared in the original publication. So I'm going to have the graphics, the topography, and so forth. I don't have the translator read aloud features here, but this is much nicer to look at. And you do get those graphics. You can do all the same things with the PDF that you can do with the HTML, but just one word of caution that this print icon that you see here at the right, I, I pointed to that briefly with the HTML, that doesn't really work so well with the PDF. If you want to print out a PDF, it's best to use the, the print icon, which appears here in Adobe Acrobat Reader. And right now I'm using Firefox to view this, and the print icon shows up here in a menu area. In, um, with other browsers, it might not show up there. Sometimes it shows up in a, a uh, menu that appears when you hover your mouse, kind of in this region, region but use, the, use that. Now, the one thing that you can do with PDF that you can't do with HTML is that you are able to browse that entire issue of this magazine. And that can be helpful. Sometimes you'll find a magazine or a journal that's done a special issue on a particular topic. And there might be other articles here that are interesting. I click here on the left so I can browse around. All right, so that's some of the ways we can use that full text. Uh, note that we have images as well that come up, and those can be saved. Those can be emailed just like the documents. If 18,041 articles is a little bit too much to read, if I want to uh, filter or narrow down that search a little bit, I can do that by using the filtering options that are here on the left-hand side. And these are going to vary slightly depending on what interface and what database I'm using. But typically, you can limit by document type, by subject, by publication. Sometimes it's interesting to bring up this uh, publication filter just to get an idea for the range of uh, publications that are being indexed in this database. So initially, with any of these filters, I'm going to see the top six uh, based on my current results set. If I click on Show More, I'll see the top 50. Again, based on my current results set, these are ranked in order of frequency of occurrence. But if I click on Name, that will rank them alphabetically. Now, there are other ways to find information from particular publications, and I'll show you how to do that in just a bit. And someone out there, you should keep track of every time I say, I'm going to show you how to do something, um, make sure that I do. All right. Um, another very valuable filter here is the uh, subject filter. I opened that up earlier. So sometimes when I type in a search, if it's too broad, if I'm finding too much content, I can narrow that down using the subject heading. So obviously, I typed in 
Justin Trudeau, so a lot of these articles are going to be about Justin Trudeau. But if I click on name and sort those alphabetically, say, well, what about Justin Trudeau do I want to read about? Maybe Justin Trudeau and elections, or Justin Trudeau and um, Stephen Harper, articles about both of them, and so forth. Let's look at um, how about Justin Trudeau and petroleum pipelines, just as an example. If I click on that and update, that's going to limit to that list of articles. Now, if I wanted to do a more precise search, I can do that from the advanced search page. I'm here instead of the one search box, I have three, and I can pick the field that I want to search in and add things together. So if I was interested in Justin Trudeau and petroleum, I always pick things I can't spell. Let's just leave it at Justin Trudeau and petroleum. I can do that. Um, I have the option of searching within the full text of the article. I want to broaden that search a little bit, and I can apply some of those filters and limiters after the fact. So let's say we want articles about Justin Trudeau and petroleum. We want to limit it to sources published in Canada and that are available in PDF. I did something wrong. So I did that on purpose. <laughs> no, I didn't. Um, I just wanted to show you sometimes what will happen uh, when you're searching in EBSCOhost, it will remember limiters or filters that you had placed in the previous search. And if you ever run into an issue like that, uh, you can just uh, click on that EBSCOhost logo. That kind of clears everything out. Let's go back to advanced search and we'll try that again. I know this is going to, or you can click the clear button. I could have done that. Petroleum. Yes, yeah, so we have 39 searches, or 39 results there. Anyway, you get the idea. Um, you can combine searches, do something more precise using the advanced search page. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to uh, send them in. All right, so those are, or the, that is using the classic EBSCO host interface to search databases. I want to look at the other interfaces as well, including Explora. I'm going to touch on a few of these. Now, Explora, here we're searching a lot of those same databases. Here in Explora Canada, we're searching that uh, Canada Reference Center. We're searching the Middle Search, which is the, uh, the middle school database. Uh, we're searching the AP database. So this is a way that we can broaden our search by searching multiple databases. We have the same search tools, the search box and the search button. We have the advanced search screen. We can compose our you know, more advanced search. But Explora also gives us some browsing tools. And this is great for, for students or people who might not be comfortable with that, uh, that maybe that scary looking EBSCO web interface, EBSCO host interface. And with Explora, you always have a banner here. And this is going to have topics of interest, of general interest. The topics that you see in the banner, they're going to change from, well, from week to week. You'll always find something new up here. And then down below, we can search by topic area or browse by topic area. And these are broken down into broad topics. Um, we can click on one of the featured items here. Or if we uh, click on more, that will give us an entire list of topics. If I scroll through here and pick one, 
kind of at random. I don't know. Economic growth. Whenever you select one of these topics, the first thing you're going to see up at the top is going to be the topic overview. And this is an encyclopedia article, essentially. Sometimes that's all people want. They just want that overview. And if, they, if that's what they want, there's the overview and they're done. One thing we've discovered, though, is that even at the undergraduate level, if people are planning to do more in-depth research, uh, they want to see the topic overview first. They want that, uh, that background before they start doing a more in-depth research. So that works for, for both purposes. And then down below, I have the various articles ranked by relevance. along with the associated press video. The research tips popped up. Now, one thing I wanted to talk about, uh, one way that you can use these articles is you can create folders and uh, save articles to folders. Those folders can be shared with students. Um, it can be a one-way sharing where you put articles into a folder and then give the students access to your folder. You can also set up collaborative folders. If you have a, a group project where a group of students are working on the same topic, um, they can create a, a group folder, a collaborative folder. In order to create the folders, you do need to log into My EBSCO host first. And you can do that from any one of these interfaces. But let's, um, let's start out. Before we log in, I'm going to add a few of these articles. Let's pretend, oh, that looks interesting. This looks interesting. We can add it to the folder by clicking on that folder icon. And these are being added to my folder, but they're being added to my session folder. Now, what that means is this information is going to go away at the end of the session. So what good is it? Well, if I'm, if I'm working with a student and I'm finding some articles that might be of interest to them, rather than stopping to email or print out every article, I can put them here into the session folder. And then when we found everything we're looking for, we just select all. And then we can email those all at once. Then the next time I come into Explora or any one of these interfaces, I'll have an empty folder and I can start from scratch. But if I want to keep this for later use, I'll need to sign in. And uh, you, any one of your students, they can create their own MyEBSCO host account. And I have actually not created one for this EBSCO account yet. So let me create one really quickly. Whoops. And just while Joe is typing there, uh, Patricia brought it to my attention that uh, the discussion chat box closed as soon as we did the screen share. So if you're seeing no chat box, you can open that again by clicking on the little arrow on the left side of your screen, and that will unfold that section to see the chat box to be able to ask questions. Okay. Great, thank you. I was, I was trying to think, I, I'm not seeing that. Actually, if you see questions come in, Chris, that uh, I'm missing, um, let me know. Okay, so I was going to log in. And um, here, when you create an account in Explora, uh, out of, uh, for privacy reasons, in the Explora interface, we don't prompt for a last name or an email address. So if you want to stay a little bit private, you, know, you can create it from here. Um, if, you, if I created this in one of the other inter, in a non-Explora interface, it would prompt me for my last name. But let's just do this quickly. And so once that account's been created, you'll see I'm now in Joe's folder. And then this information will persist. I can log off and log back on again. And I'll find this information. And I can use this folder across all of the EBSCO resources. Other ways to share this with other people. And I don't have time to go into all of that, but I'll show you um, where you can find more information. All right, so that's Explora. Canada. Let's look at uh, just one other version of Explora. They're all pretty much the same except for content. I don't want to take a lot of time on this, but I do want to look at Explora primary schools.
which is essentially a more simplified version of Explora. Um, the content is geared more toward the uh, younger students, and the browsing is just more colorful. Instead of a long list of scary topics, we have some nice graphics and things. Um, otherwise, it works pretty much the same way as Explora Canada or any of the other versions of Explora. All right, let's talk. Uh, I don't want to, thinking about time here, let's talk about some of these other interfaces. So EBSCOhost Web, um, again, that's the, uh, the advanced interface where you can search everything. All of the content, Explora is another multidisciplinary database that's a little bit easier to search, a little bit more user friendly. Um, I do want to talk about uh, just a little bit about each of these other um, subject specific interfaces. And I do urge you to spend time on your own exploring these because I don't have the time to go into a lot of detail, but you will find some commonalities among these interfaces. For example, in History Reference Center, we have a search box, we have a search button, we have a browsing method which is based on or designed for this type of content. And yes, it's U.S. based. I'm sorry about that. But uh, if we, we can look at timelines of either U.S. history or world history to browse. And then down below, there are popular sources. So these popular sources in the History Reference Center, they're history reference books. There are, there are hundreds and hundreds of history reference books available. Um, I love these Everyday Life and Ancient Times books. If you want to know what people did, or everyday life books, this is ancient times. Um, if you want to know what people did for fun in ancient times, there's a chapter on that. And we have those everyday life uh, books for other time periods as well. Now, these uh, book chapters can be treated just like those uh, magazine and journal articles that we saw before. They can be added to a folder. They can be printed out emailed, etc. The uh, History Reference Center also includes a great deal of historical images and historical video. So if you're, uh, if history is, if you teach history or you, if you're interested in history, I do recommend that you come in and explore this reference center a little bit more. Lots of good stuff here. There's an advanced search. Just wanted to point that out. The Science Reference Center, you can probably guess, includes science content. Let's make that just a little bit bigger. Um, and the browsing tools apply to scientific categories. If you want to go to space sciences and astronomy and learn about the Big Bang Theory. That will take you to a list of uh, articles about the Big Bang Theory. And one funny thing I found is that if you're looking for articles about the Big Bang Theory, Science Reference Center is a good place to go to get them. If you try one of the more general databases, like uh, the advanced, well, not advanced placement, but, but some of the more general da magazine databases that you have access to, if you type in Big Bang Theory, uh, your results tend to get swamped by articles about the TV show, The Big Bang Theory, and not the actual Big Bang Theory. But with Science, and Refer Science Reference Center, you're safe. Now, a lot of these reference centers have additional content beyond the the handbooks, the reference books, the magazine articles. Um, here in Science Reference Center, we have links to uh, lesson plans, which is handy. And one thing that I absolutely will show you is how to find more information on lesson planning using EBSCOhost. But here in Science Reference Center, we have teacher's guides and lesson plans to do with science. In the Literary Reference Center, you've already guessed, right? This uh, information about uh, literary topics, about authors, about uh, works, about um, literary movements, all of that information is contained here. So if we're looking for uh, 
Margaret Atwood, for example. We can do a quick quick search. And the source types include, in this particular uh, reference center, include uh, magazines and reviews, but also literary criticism, uh, information from reference books, um, plot summaries. There are uh, master plot summaries for uh, many, many literary works are available here in the Literary Reference Center. And remember, I'm kind of going quickly through some of these reference centers, but everything I've talked about in terms of folder creation, um, using full text, you know, how to search using advanced search, that all applies in the reference centers as it does in the other, in EBSCOhost or in Explora. And then the final area or the final reference center that I want to touch on is Canadian points of view. And this is very different. It's different from a lot of the other reference centers in that it is, it's designed with a specific purpose to uh, help people, to help students write um, persuasive or argumentative papers. And what we've done here is we've taken um, hundreds of controversial topics and we've broken them down. We, we include a topic overview, a point, a counterpoint, um, information about how to approach the topic, along with links to articles about that topic in many, many different opinion magazines that, that are both left, right, center, all over the political spectrum. And for those topics, uh, there's a list, of them down a list of them down below. There's some featured topics in the carousel. You'll get used to seeing carousels. And then down below, there's a complete list of topics. So if you're um, interested in about uh, Aboriginal fishing in the Maritimes, let's try that one. For each one of those topics, there's a topic overview, which just gives an, introdu an introduction to the controversy. There is a point, and that will be uh, someone taking one position on that controversy. There's a counterpoint presenting the opposite position. And then a guide to critical analysis, which gives information on you know, how to determine you know, what's an opinion and what's a fact, um, some ideas for things to uh, think about when you're reading information about, the, uh, when you're reading additional information on this topic. And then there's related information. You can find uh, opinions from Canadian magazines, from international magazines, from reference books, from academic journals, whatever you need to put together um, that, that persuasive or argumentative paper. And I found this is great too, you know, even if you're not a student writing an argumentative paper, if there's a controversy or a topic that's in the news and you just want to see both sides to kind of figure out where you stand on that topic, um, Points of View Reference Center is a great place to go for that information. All right, so I only have a few minutes left. I have more than a few, but I do want to make sure that I leave lots of time for questions. But let me spend a little bit of time talking about other ways that you can incorporate this information into the classroom. Now, we've seen, you know, we have our options for printing out text. Um, we can find uh, videos. We can find graphics. We can find magazine articles, journal articles that we can print out, that we can share with our students. Um, but there's also some helps here to, uh, to help put it all together. And we looked at those, those just lost my train of thought. We, we looked at those uh, lesson plans in Science Reference Center. We don't have lesson plans listed ex explicitly in every reference center. But I want to look at one more version of Explora. And that is the Explora for Educators. And so this includes information from the professional literature. So if you want to use this for professional development, uh, working on an advanced degree in education, 
Uh, this will uh, provide access to those, those journal articles and so forth. Um, like the other versions of Explora, there's a banner up here at the top. You can do a search. So we wanted to do a search for ADHD and reading comprehension or reading strategies. We can get a list of uh, professional articles on that topic. But we can also use this to search for lesson plans. And, and down below, we have some that we have explicitly linked for STEM, geometry, and American history. If I click on that link, that will actually take me to a list of STEM lesson plans, which is handy. But you might be thinking, wait a minute, I don't teach STEM, I don't teach geography, I don't teach American history. What about me? Well, one trick you can do if you're not a STEM teacher, if you're an English teacher, language arts, you can just change that search from STEM to poetry and get lesson plans on poetry, for example. Now, another source for that sort of information is the EBSCO help site. You'll find that at help.ebsco.com. There are a couple of ways of accessing this type of information. What I like to do is just go to the search box and type in lesson plan. And the very first result is where can I find lesson plans that integrate EBSCO resources. So we have, uh, at EBSCO, we, we've prepared lesson plans. We've also uh, borrowed lesson plans from, uh, other, from teachers who are working with EBSCO, including those here. And this is an ever-growing list of resources. If, uh, say, for Explora, you're looking for a lesson plan that would uh, integrate Explora into the classroom, um, here's an example of Middle School Life in Ancient Egypt. Let's just take a look at that one, for example. And these are in PDF. I'll open that up. And so here's a complete lesson plan, how to use Explora. Now it's tied into Common Core, which is a US thing, but it's a very uh, standards-based lesson plan. Um, you can uh, print this out and use it in the classroom, leave it for a substitute. Um, or you can feel free to modify it in any way to make it uh, more appropriate for what you need. But this includes uh, uh, work with Explora, you know, online literacy, how to use databases, suggestions for uh, connections, activities sometimes in the younger grades. But you'll find these lesson plans. As I said, you can use them as they are. You can um, modify them in any way. You're certainly free to do that. Or you can just use them as inspiration for, you know, how do I go about creating a lesson plan that incorporates these online resources? Um, here we have some suggestions for you. And that's all at help.ebsco.com. And with that, I think we're coming up to the end of the time. I'm going to stop all of this sharing and bring us back to the main screen. So now that makes it easier for people to type in questions and for me to see questions. And I'll just open up the floor. Are there any questions? That's good. Thanks, Joe. Um, if you have questions, you can type them into the chat box right now. And uh, I'll just get you to mute your mic, Joe, while I'm talking for a moment. I, there were a couple questions throughout the presentation that popped up. Um, one was having to do with not being able to log into EBSCO from Straight Regional uh, Center for Education and looking for login credentials. Uh, outside of schools. Um, and that's something that I'm going to have to look into uh, and get back to you. But if you registered for today's webinar um, through the NS Ed Talk webinar series, then I will look up your email addresses and, and send that out to you uh, as soon as I get that information. I can't seem to pull it up on my computer right away. And I don't think Joe knows that off the top of his head. Maybe he does. But um, if there are any other questions for Joe, 
I did have one question for you, Joe, actually, while you were doing your presentation. I was wondering if there is um, a mechanism within EBSCO to uh, set up um, email responses for certain search criteria. So when articles that come up with that search criteria, can, they, can you be alerted uh, via email through EBSCO? Is that a possibility? Oh, yes, it is. And that's, um, I, I didn't, didn't get into that, but uh, you can certainly find that information on the EBSCO help site. But it, it's fairly simple. Um, you can, there is a, a, a share function with a search, and you can, once you're logged into My EBSCO host, you can very easily set up a search alert. You can also set up search alerts for publications. So if you wanted to, the next time National Geographic Explorer Explorer gets uh, loaded into EBSCO, you can get a search alert that has the table of contents in it. So yeah, there's lots of uh, lots of options for alerts. Um, if you want more information on uh, any of that sort of info, any of that sort of thing, um, if you go to that help.ebsco.com page, there are video tutorials and uh, text tutorials on how to set that up. That's fantastic. Thanks, Joe. And uh, maybe we'll get you back for uh, a second round of uh, more in-depth uh, overview of some of the things that EBSCO has to offer. But I want to thank Joe uh, for his time today calling in um, to, to facilitate or to present this uh, on EBSCO. And I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today. And uh, being mindful of the time, I'm, I'm going to say thank you and uh, have a great day. All right, thank you, everyone. Thanks, Susan. I'll, I'll be on that today and uh, get something out to you right away about how to get that login straightened away. Thanks for joining us, everyone.